please uh, let it inform me when we oh, we are already broadcasting. Okay. Uh, Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos para mais uma palestra que é organizada pela linha de pesquisa em cultura política do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciência Política da URGS. É, essa palestra ela é em parceria com o CESP, o Núcleo de Estudos e Pesquisa em Cultura Política, Estado e Relações Internacionais aqui da URGS também. Hoje a gente está recebendo o Joseph Clarkson. Ele é doutorando em Ciência Política pela Universidade de Notre Dame para a palestra Law vs. Dictatorship. An Introduction to Herman Heller's Theory of State. Uh, lembrando a todos vocês que, ao longo da palestra, vocês podem enviar perguntas pelo bate-papo, pelos comentários né, no YouTube. E ao final da fala do Joseph, ele vai responder essas perguntas que vocês mandarem. Vai, vai ter um tempinho ali para ele endereçar tudo que vocês uh, tiverem de dúvidas. Agora eu peço licença para vocês, para os nossos ouvintes, para introduzir o Joseph no, no idioma dele, que é o inglês. Joseph Clarkson is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Notre Dame, focusing on political theory and international relations in his research. Before he arrived at, at Notre Dame, Joseph studied philosophy and classical and German languages at Baylor University, where he completed his undergraduate degree in 2019. Currently, Uh, he's researching the intellectual story of structural explanations for war occurrence and the influence of Weimar political thought on American political science in the 20th century. Joseph, uh, thank you very much for your time here with us today, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, before we start with the lecture, I want to say just a brief word uh, in Portuguese. Uh, so, oi, Genshi. Uh, como ela, ela disse, eu me chamo Joseph Clarkson. Eu estou muito feliz para conversar com, com vocês e agradeço ao professor Henrique por me convidar e por me permitir que eu apresente a minha pesquisa para vocês. Essa pequena palestra que eu apresento hoje trata-se do tema da minha dissertação, a teoria do estado do Herman Heller. Infelizmente, eu não posso falar português muito bem, e por isso eu vou continuar em inglês, se vocês me permitiram. So, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, the lecture is uh, about law versus dictatorship, an introduction to Herman Heller's theory of state. And uh, I want to give first some uh, historical background for this theme. Uh, so that you can understand why I think it's interesting um, and why I think it matters uh, for our contemporary ways of thinking about the state and for the political practice as well. Um, and so first, I'm going to speak a little bit about Herman Heller's life and then his engagement with uh, Carl Schmitt, who was his main political uh, opponent and one of his main theoretical uh, adversaries as well, uh, and then look at Carl Schmitt's argument for personalist or dictator uh, sovereignty, and then uh, look at how Herman Heller interprets this and responds to it uh, with his own theory of the state. Um, so, Herman Heller uh, was born into a Jewish family in Teschen, which is now uh, in Poland, but at that time it was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, He studied law and political science in Vienna, Graz, Innsbruck, and Kiel. Uh, and then he served, he volunteered in the First World War and contracted a heart condition on the Russian front, which made him unfit to continue his service in the military, uh, at least in a combat capacity. And so he served as an assessist for the military court until the end of the war. After that, Uh, he published his book, which was based on his uh, habilitation thesis, which was called Hegel and the Idea of the Power State in Germany, uh, which traced some of the sort of realist ideas of state back to Hegel's uh, philosophy. And then uh, in 1925, he published a book on socialism and nation, where he argued for uh, a kind of a non-Marxist version of social Uh, democracy against the um, sort of stateless form of Marxism. Then uh, subsequently, he wrote a book 
called Sovereignty, where he deals specifically uh, with the problem of sovereignty and how it relates both to public law uh, and the constitution of states and to uh, international law and international relations. This book was actually just recently uh, in 2019 published in English for the first time. And it's the only book of Heller's that has been translated into English. Uh, but there has been a growing uh, interest in his research uh, and this recently, and this book is evidence of that. Uh, then the next year in 1928, he became a, a professor at the University of Berlin, a professor of public law, and subsequently published one of the uh, earliest analyses of Europe and fascism. It's a, it's a very it's a critical analysis of Italian fascism, along with its uh, relationship to fascism in Germany. And uh, he then subsequently uh, published another edition of this in 1931. It still has not been translated into English, which is surprising because it is one of the earliest critical treatments of the topic. And then in 1930, he published an important uh, book called Rule of Law or Dictatorship, where he defends the what he calls the social Rechstaat, the, the Rechstaat, the rule of the state characterized by rule of law against dictatorship. And then uh, he faces Carl Schmitt, the fascist uh, political theorist and uh, theorist of law in the court case Prussia versus Reich, which uh, was dealing with the extent of the power that the Reich had relative to the uh, the state or the, the smaller land uh, of Prussia. And so there was a conflict between sort of the rights of states versus the uh, federal or higher uh, level of power. Carl Schmidt was representing the Reich and Hermann Heller uh, defends the Prussian government, which was largely uh, at that time uh, populated by social democrats from uh, the party that Heller was involved in. Then uh, this same year, he's appointed professor at the University of Frankfurt. And then in 1933, he has to uh, flee Germany. Why he, he was giving lectures at um, Oxford and uh, the London School of Economics, but was not able to return to Germany that year because uh, it was becoming increasingly dangerous for Jews in Germany. Uh, and so he accepted a temporary position in Madrid where he was uh, friends with um, other philosophers, including Ortega y Gasset. Um, and then he dies this year at the age of 42 from the heart condition that he had contracted in the war. So his story is very short, um, but it's very dramatic. It's uh, with the rise of Nazism in Germany and uh, the ways in which he was already identifying the trends that would later lead to the Nazi state and uh, trying to combat those both theoretically and uh, practically through his legal activities. So I want to give a little bit of background for sort of the theoretical crisis that was taking place in the Weimar Republic at this time. Uh, most importantly, Carl, Sch Carl Schmidt is Heller's opponent in this regard. Um, and Carl Schmidt, he's now known as the crown jurist of the Third Reich. Uh, this was an appellation that was given to him by Bidemar Gurian, who was a professor actually at Notre Dame, uh, where I am now a graduate student. Um, and uh, so Carl Schmidt, he's, he was born in 1888 in a Roman Catholic family in Prussia. And then he completes his habilitation in Strasbourg in 1916. So he's roughly a contemporary of uh, Heller's, although he's slightly older. Then in 1921, he publishes an important book on dictatorship where he looks at the history of uh, dictatorship and argues for a distinction between commissarial dictatorship and sovereign dictatorship. Uh, the one being where the sovereign authority is delegated to other powers who then act on behalf of uh, sort of this, the center of power. And then the other form being uh, really the sovereign dictatorship, which he would come to argue for more and more in his subsequent work, specifically his political theology, which is a book about the concept of sovereignty, where he seems to lean even more towards the sovereign characterization of dictatorship. 
Uh, he then writes a book on the crisis of parliamentary democracy uh, in Germany, publishes that in 1923. Then in 1926, he's excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church because of his divorce. Um, and then in 1927, he publishes an article which would later become in 1932, uh, his book, The Concept of the Political, which is his most well-known work. Uh, and we'll discuss this one a little bit later uh, when I talk about sort of his ideas more substantively. Um, in 1928, he writes a book on constitutional theory where he really works out the system of laws that applies to Germany and argues that Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution allows a much uh, more powerful executive uh, that's not as constrained by law as theorists like Hermann Heller would have uh, it be. Then in 1932, he confronts Heller in Prussia versus Reich, as we already mentioned. And then in 1933, he joins the Nazi party. He replaces Heller at the University of Berlin. He's appointed the state councillor for Prussia by Goering and becomes president of the Union of National Socialist Jurists. Then Subsequently, after Heller's death, he falls out of favor with the Nazis uh, because they suspect that he was sort of just taking advantage of the opportunity to gain uh, power for himself. They also were suspicious that he was a Hegelian and that he may still have sympathies with Roman Catholicism. And so uh, he was removed from his official positions within the party as their head jurist. So that sort of gives you the biographical background for both of these thinkers. And now I want to get really into the clash of ideas that characterize their exchange. So let's begin with Schmidt's concept of the political, which is his most well-known concept. Schmidt defines the political as the distinction between friend and enemy, which he says is the most extreme and most intense degree of union or separation. And it's characterized by the possibility of real physical killing. So this is really an existential way of thinking about the political. It's about life and death, and it's a struggle. Uh, and this is ultimately what gives rise to political behaviors and political communities. And he says in the concept of the political that the political grouping is sovereign in the sense that the decision about the critical situation, even if it is the exception, must always necessarily reside there. So he connects he connects his conception of the political with his concept of sovereignty, which he had worked out in his book, uh, Political Theology. So in political theology, he says that the sovereign is the one who decides on the exception. And this sovereign is seen as standing outside of the law in some way while also being within the law because he is, uh, he is the one who has to decide whether the constitution applies or not. And so uh, the sovereign is imagined as a person or a small group of people who can suspend the constitution and the rule of law in order to guarantee a situation of normalcy and order in which law can be applied. And so because of this, the sovereign is seen as beyond the law and not constrained by the law. It's always virtually the law is, uh, as it were, partially suspended in the person of the sovereign. So then in sovereign nation states, he claims that the state acts in many disguises, but always is the same invisible person. The omnipotence of the modern lawgiver, giver, of which one reads in every textbook on public law, is not only linguistically derived from theology. So here you can see how he is really trying to emphasize the ways in which this is one person. Behind the state, there is one person who is at the core, who is making decisions uh, about the law. And in particular, he has a practical problem in mind. If you think about the way that law works, law is sort of a general system, but it has to apply to concrete situations. And so there does need to be some element of judgment that's exercised. There has to be a way to make decisions about how the law applies to particular cases. And he is sort of exploiting this uh, fact in order to argue that within the state, there is this person who is ultimately always virtually beyond law while also being within the law as sort of the guarantor of the law. And this idea he works out later 
uh, even in more detail in his articles that were published during the Nazi period, for example, in an article where uh, called The Fuhrer Protects the Law, uh, where he argues that the Fuhrer is ultimately uh, sort of the source of law within the German state. Um, so this is the background that I want to begin with. And now I want to work out how Heller tries to counteract this theory uh, and why this is relevant for us today. So for Hermann Heller, he begins with a methodological holism. He wants to have a political science that is realistic in that it, it studies uh, reality in a, as sort of, um, yeah, as a non-reductionist theory of reality. And so he doesn't want to reduce uh, the political system or the state to just material factors or just economic factors or just law in the ways that other theorists had, but wants to have a holistic approach that incorporates economic, legal, uh, and power considerations all in, uh, together into a general theory of the state. And the way that he tries to do this is by thinking about the state as a structure or a gestalt. Um, the word is translatable into English as shape, perhaps, but it's known now mostly through uh, gestalt psychology, which is which talks about the ways in which we foreground um, certain perceptions. And so, for example, here in this uh, gestalt, one can see a face if one looks at it one way, or one can see a vase if you look at it the other way. And in a similar way, he thinks that there are different lenses through which the state must be analyzed in order to have a correct grasp of it. And you can't look at it in only one or the other way without somehow falsifying it. Um, and so he uses this concept of Gestalt um, to keep away the false notion of a spatial aggregate that can be broken down into parts. Neither can the Gestalt be derived from elements nor the elements from the Gestalt. And in this way, he this is how he thinks about organizations. And the state is a kind of organization for Heller. So he says that in every organization, there are three necessary elements. These are a social action of a plurality of people that is geared toward mutual behavior, whose interaction is regularly oriented by a rule-based order, and whose settlement and securing is administered by special organs. So in any organization, there are these three elements at play, whether it be a group of, the example that he uses is a group of people putting out a fire. They come together, it's a plurality of people, but they're unified in one action, and the effect that they're able to bring about is actually greater than the sum of the individual contributions of the people because the organized behavior has different characteristics than just the individual behaviors that comprise it. Um, and one can think of this as in the ways in which, for example, uh, flocks of birds fly in the sky. The behavior is different from the individual flight path of a bird because the birds are orienting themselves in relation to each other and not merely in relation to their environment. Um, and so he's arguing that the state is a similar sort of thing where one can't just see it as an aggreg aggregate of individuals or as uh, the bureaucracy and the legislative branch and the ju judicial branch, but has to be taken as all of these things in relation to each other simultaneously, which creates something that is larger than the individual parts. Um, and so because of this, he says the effect cannot be attributed either causally or normatively, either quantitatively or qualitatively, either economically or along the lines of conventional politics or juristically to a single element of the organization. Neither the order nor the organs or the members on their own account uh, may be equated in any respect with the organization which is made up of all these three components. So with this sort of methodological approach in mind, we can now look at how he defines the state. For Heller, the state is, like all humans' associations, an, a, an association of power. The state has power, I, everyone would agree with this, but because every institution has power, there needs to be some way of distinguishing state power from other kinds of institutions and other kinds of power. Um, and so he says that, Without establishing a meaningful function of the specific state power, it cannot be distinguished from a band of robbers, a coal cartel, or a bowling club. 
So how does he try to distinguish it? Well, he sees basically two ways in which state power is different from other kinds of power. It's through sovereignty and territory directedness that the state uh, has its specific character. Uh, as this, and here I have the quote where he specifically states this. But this, of course, raises the question: What is sovereignty? Territoriality is relatively straightforward, unlike the church or something like this, which doesn't have a specific land over which it has jurisdiction, but merely members. The state specifically has borders and claims to have jurisdiction over these. And then there's sovereignty, which seems to be something different. And it seems to be something harder to understand. Well, Heller thinks that a state can only be sovereign because it provides a particular validity for its order. And it, every institution, every order in some ways is able to convince people of its validity or its necessity. And so people are willing to uh, come together into the common activity of that institution. But the state, because it stands over all of these, has a sort of higher claim of validity. And, and so it must be something very uh, specific. For Heller, in his uh, book on Europe and fascism, he says that only a command which motivates the will to political unity through specific normative contents possesses authority. So it's not sufficient to explain state power as purely the most powerful uh, of all aggregations of power, but rather that it also has a kind of normative element through which the political unity is brought about. And so within the dynamic of socio-historical relations of domination, a power situation becomes a political status only through law. Precisely for the state, normativity and existentiality are not opposites, but mutual conditions. So a group only becomes political when it becomes a group that is organized under law, that has a kind of normative uh, validity for those who are subject to it and who can then to some degree identify with that uh, that norm that and take those norms as the object of their own will which then then can be a basis for their cooperative action so with this definition of the state and of sovereignty in the background uh heller makes a very strong what i think is a very strong argument for the rule of law that is very strong because it accepts schmidt's critique of liberalism while also incorporating it and overcoming it uh, and settling in favor of a more democratic uh, state that is that has the rule of law. So if we remember Schmidt's methodological holism, or uh, excuse me, Heller's methodological holism, we can sort of see where he's getting at. He says, like, like it's very opposite, the theory of the state as the people the theory of the ruler fails to recognize the fact that every ruling organization realizes itself only as a unit of empowered rulers and empowering subjects. So it's not that the state can be identified with a specific uh, function or organ within the, the, the territory. Instead, it, is, it has to be simultaneously conceived as those who are within the regime, as well as those who are under the regime, and that these together uh, form the state. And because of this, the holder of power has power within the state, but he never possesses the power of the state. Uh, Heller emphasizes this, he even puts it in italics in the original text, in order to, uh, because here he's really sort of going against Schmidt's conception of sovereignty. It's not that the, the state is the sovereign who is a person, but rather the sovereign exists within this larger, uh, actually the sovereign cannot be uh, localized in a person. The sovereign, uh, the sovereignty is diffused throughout the state organization. It can't be localized in any of the specific elements. So it can't be uh, the holders of power who are sovereign because the sovereignty can't actually be localized in any of the, specific elements. So because of this, Heller concludes that sovereign is the legislating, that is the constitution giving power, but this is the state organization as a whole. So here he has a holistic conception of sovereignty, which goes along with his holistic conception of the state, which follows from his holistic 
methodology. And with this, he's able to make an argument for popular sovereignty. He says that although popular sovereignty is a polemical principle and that it is, there is no pure realization of this principle in political life, nevertheless, his holism allows him to conclude that the autocratic notion of sovereignty must depart from political reality, not less, but rather much more than the principle of people sovereignty. For only an omniscient and omnipotent autocrat could direct with full freedom of decision the entangled mammoth organization of the contemporary state with its entangled international dependencies. So here the idea is that even though popular sovereignty is not exactly accurate because it ascribes sovereignty to only a part of the organization rather than to the whole, it is actually more realistic than the autocratic conception of sovereignty, which localizes it in a much smaller uh, subset of the state and a much more limited element within the state. Uh, and so he's able to provide an argument for a democratic conception uh, of the rule of law that's, that recognizes that yes, this is to some degree a falsification of reality. The state is in fact more complex uh, and popular sovereignty does not quite get at this complexity, but it is much better than the other dominant uh, argument for sovereignty, which localizes sovereignty within only one element or one small group within the state. And so uh, this is uh, a holistic argument that I think is very realistic and is interesting because it's able to accept to some degree the argument that Schmidt makes, which is that there has to be some, there has to be, there have to be uh, decisions made, there has to be a human element within, for in order for law to apply, because decisions must be made, and yet it doesn't uh, fall into the trap of coming to endorse dictatorship, because it recognizes that this sovereignty can't be located in any one organ of the state, but rather is attributable only to the state as a whole. Uh, and so it this, I, this definition of sovereignty uh, and of the state is able to take the critique of liberalism seriously while also overcoming it. And this I think is very uh, relevant for us today because in recent times there have been many efforts to try to reestablish uh, this sort of uh, more autocratic conception of sovereignty. For example, in the United States, uh, there has been a growing interest in Schmidt's thought and a growing number of people have begun to uh, work towards uh, decreasing the, the legal limits on executive authority. Uh, in this regard, there's a legal scholar named Adrian Vermula, who is well known because he has argued for a Schmidtian conception of administrative law. Uh, and he was appointed by Trump as an, uh, to a judiciary, judiciary oversight committee. Um, similarly, in international relations, theorists such as John Mearsheimer have endorsed the Schmidian conception of sovereignty, and one of his students has uh, a working paper which uh, is available from the Social Sciences Research Network in which she argues uh, for Schmidt's conception of sovereignty based on the conception that, or the distinction that he makes in his book on dictatorship between the commissarial uh, versus sovereign dictatorship. And uh, the idea is that modern states are not constrained by the by international law and by international institutions because this is only delegated sovereignty, which the sovereign can always retract into his own person. And in this way of thinking about sovereignty, we still see this sort of part to whole uh, fallacy taking place. There's it's not a conception of sovereignty as residing within the state as a whole, but rather the sovereign on this conception is a person, and that person is able to delegate the sovereignty to uh, other organizations, to the bureaucracy, um, to international institutions and things like this, but then whenever uh, it's judged necessary can retract that sovereignty. Uh, and so this Schmidian conception is still alive and well. I think, uh, Perhaps even in Brazil, this has some uh, renewed uh, relevance because of 
the various attempts of Bolsonaro's government to perhaps uh, retract sovereignty into a more personalistic uh, conception. And so I think that both practically and theoretically, Heller's work remains interesting because he's able to take into account the challenges that Schmidt and Schmidt's followers pose to the liberal order while also uh, incorporating them into a more holistic uh, theory of the state, which is able to support a democracy, which has a division of powers and is able to protect individual freedoms for uh, various people. So on the whole, I think that uh, Heller's theory is very interesting and that this can to some degree explain why there has been such a renewed interest in uh, Heller's thought in the US in the last couple of years. Uh, and in fact, I think there's also been a revival uh, perhaps here in Brazil as well. I don't know the Portuguese uh, literature on Heller very well, but there have been several articles published in the last two or three years dealing with his theory of law and of sovereignty and of the state. Uh, and so I think that it's good that this these ideas are making a comeback. Uh, and so I hope that this uh, is useful for you and that it uh, sparks some kind of uh, research or future uh, attempts to understand sovereignty as it applies to our current complex, uh, uh, context and its relationship uh, to law, especially international law and the role that international institutions play. Um, but I want to leave it at that. I can't uh, do too much in this lecture and I want to uh, leave lots of time for questions. And so uh, I'll leave it there. And uh, yes, here are some of the uh, works that I referenced, as or, uh, referenced or used in uh, the lecture. Uh, but with that, I would like to uh, open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It was very enlightening, your lecture. And I'm sure that everyone here, we're gonna leave the, this, this, uh, this lecture with a lot of thoughts on state politics and the importance of normative theory and political theory to understand our uh, current phenomena, current political and social phenomena. Well, uh, as you said, we should open to questions from the audience right now. Uh, while people were, are thinking about what, uh, what question to you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a question that I have for myself. And I have to say that inevitably, as a political scientist with a culturalistic background, I have to ask you, uh, what you understand as the role of political culture in these in these issues, the role of political culture in shaping states sovereignty, especially considering the holistic perspective that you presented to, to us from Heller's theory. That's a very good question. Uh, yeah, I think the way that Heller would understand this is that uh, he would say that political culture is important for this understanding because the law is supposed to be a system of validity. It's not simply arbitrary norms that are then imposed, but it's supposed to be valid uh, for the people who are the subjects of the law. And uh, because of this, there are certain norms and values which are embodied in law. And so uh, Heller talks about uh, various, uh, Things which, well, he talks about there are logical norms which govern the relationship between law and the state, but there are also ethical ones. Uh, and, and in this way, it's important, he thinks, to have uh, some shared values within a culture because this enables law to uh, be stronger because there is then a sort of more solid foundation in which the validity of the law uh, can be based. And he doesn't. Heller wants to avoid having a sort of idealistic theory of the validity of law. And so he doesn't go uh, in the direction of this kind of you know, law that's out there in the sky somewhere. Um, he wants to ground it within the political culture of the particular states. 
And because of this, I think that uh, political culture has a very important role for this theory because uh, the research that is done in political culture can tell us things about what the, uh, the sort of what people are wanting at a particular time, what things they're valuing at a particular time, and how this could potentially relate to uh, the law. And so I think, I think political culture fits very well here. Thank you very much. It was, <clears throat> it's important to, um, to communicate from different perspectives on political science to accomplish better explanations regarding our political phenomena nowadays. And this is very interesting that you, that you put it, um, how political culture has a role here in, in law, in state sovereignty, and in our, in our shaping regarding the political structures. Um, anyone has another question? Please, Enrique, uh, you can open the, the microphone if you want. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah. And thank you, uh, Zé, Joseph. Uh, I'd like to say that it was a wonderful uh, lecture. And not only by the subject, but also by the presentation itself, how you organized the, your talk. Thank you so much. Um, the question I'd like to ask you is, um, Heller uses the rule of law. And it's okay if you are in German, in Germany, sorry. But if you are in Latin America, the rule of law is not exactly the rule. We need try, some people try to use the law, the rule of law, in order to organize society, but it's not exactly what happens. If you look, for instance, at the favelas in Rio or in other parts, they have a sort of state in the way that people there, some, you know, groups, organize the society, organize that community in order to uh, have a day-by-day -day life. How do you think that you could use uh, Heller's theory in order to better explain that phenomenon? Thank you. This is a very, very good question, I think, uh, and very important. And I, I think that it fits very well uh, with Heller's activity in the Social Democratic Party in, in Germany, because Heller was aware of this problem. And this is one of the reasons why he did not want an ideal theory of law or a pure theory of law. He wanted law to uh, also be understood from a sociological perspective. And so he brought in Max Weber's uh, sort of sociological theory in order to complement the idea of law as a system of validity. And so he would argue, I think, that the rule of law on its own is not enough because on its own, it is, it can be a system of violence when there is gross social inequality within a state. And so at the same time, in addition to rule of law, there is needed uh, kinds of social programs which can create a kind of equal opportunity for people and that can create a kind of normal situation in which there is rough equality uh, in order for the law to then apply because equality before the law without any kind of actual social equality in the state tends to become or can become a, a, a source of domination in which there is no uh, real justice and so in order for law to recognize its validity and to achieve its goal, there needs to be a kind of uh, social democracy or something like this, which addresses these inequalities uh, in order to have this. And so I think, yeah, I think this question is very good because it gets into the more sociological dimension of his thought, which I didn't talk about as much in the lecture, uh, but it was, it was sort of the other part of, of Heller's theory. Uh, and so, yeah, I thank you for asking that question. I think, I, I hope that this sort of answers the question, but I, I don't know. Thanks. Uh, 
Well, Joseph, uh, okay. we have one. Oh, you can say, Adriana, please. <laughs> can I can I make a question then, or is there anyone else? No, you can make it. Okay. So thank you so much, Joseph, for your lecture. Um, I guess I have two questions, um, if I may. <laughs> uh, one of them is if you have any insights on why Schmidt is so popular in the US, um, considering that Heller is not, because we, for example, in Brazil, I guess we have uh, translations for Heller's work since the 70s. And I guess you mentioned that it was only last year that we actually had a, a translation in the US for Herler's work. And um, my second question would be if Herler's, uh, if when he's trying to avoid the state that is personalized into a leader, if he also uh, considers the possibility of the bureaucracy as, um, as having power within the state as well, if he makes any, um, if he tries to understand that phenomena as well uh, as, as the power of bureaucracy instead of the leader in that case. So that, that is my question. Thank you. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so in response to the first question, I think there are probably a lot of reasons why Schmidt is popular in the United States. One of them could be that so many uh, German social and political theorists uh, who fled Germany came to the United States and these theorists were often worried about Schmidt and so there was always sort of some discussion of Schmidt in American political science uh, since World War II um, but I don't think that's enough to explain it because most of these immigrants from Germany were Jewish and many of them uh, were critical of Schmidt's concept of the political. For example, Hans Morgenthau wrote his own book on the concept of the political in response to uh, Schmidt's book. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, uh, I think that that alone is not sufficient to explain it. I think really perhaps what explains it is that there is sort of a worry in the US about the extent of bureaucracy and the ways in which the state can be uh, limited, and there is an attraction to sort of cut away all the red tape by having a stronger executive. Everyone is sort of frustrated by the fact that, uh, you know, the government can bog down, there can be these this constant partisan conflict, and, and uh, it seems like uh, very little is actually ever done, and so that creates a temptation to try to put someone in power who can do away with the bureaucracy or who can uh, sort of cut through all of these uh, restraints and actually make something happen, right? And so this is something that Schmidt was aware of and uh, that he really highlights. He makes it sort of a centerpiece of his theory. And so I think that perhaps that um, explains some of the renewed interest. And uh, a lot of the theorists who have sort of supported the increased executive power in the US have been looking to Schmidt for exactly these reasons. And so, yeah, I think that's about as good of an answer as I can give to the first question. Uh, and the second question is sort of related, right? It's about bureaucracy and uh, what the relationship between personalist rule and bureaucracy is. And this is something that Heller also writes about uh, because he thinks that a democratic state ultimately does need a bureaucracy because uh, when the representatives are always being changed out, there needs to be, for continuity of government, something that's sort of stable there in the background, and that tends to be the bureaucracy. Um, and so the more frequently the leadership is changing in a democracy, sort of the stronger the bureaucracy has to be. And at the same time, because the modern, modern states cover such a vast extent of territory and have such large populations, they also need a bureaucracy in order to administer everything uh, within this space. But he would say that actually the personalist conception of sovereignty is not able to solve this because the dictator also needs a bureaucracy uh, 
because he himself is not able to implement all of the things that he needs. So he needs a very strong military that he is in some ways dependent on. The dictator um, needs a bureaucracy, which can then, you know, up enforce the dictates that of the dictator and so on. And so he would say that it's still not true that the personalist ruler actually has the sovereignty. He's still sharing it with all of these other organs. And he's just sort of further falsifying reality by claiming that he is the state, right? In fact, he's not the state. He's sharing his power with a whole lot of other uh, organs, which are only altogether conceivable as a state. And so his holism here comes in again. And yes, there's a role for bureaucracy. Um, but he would say that that's true both in the personalist state and in the democratic state. Uh, and in some ways, it's just an outgrowth of the fact that modern states are so large, they cover such a large territory, have such large populations, and also because law needs sort of regularized interactions in order to apply. And, and the bureaucracy is very effective for establishing these kinds of regular interactions uh, within a territory. So the bureaucracy, he thinks, is here to stay as long as there are modern states. And that's true both for dictatorships and for states with the rule of law. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, we have another question from the audience from our colleague, uh, uh, PhD candidate Juliana Fornes. Uh, he's, uh, she's asking, how would you explain, especially in Brazil, a constant violation of fundamental rights in a democratic rule of law? Yeah, this is a difficult question for me, in part because I'm not very familiar with uh, the specific violations in Brazil, although I'm sure that they exist. Um, and here I think uh, what, what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the need for to complement a theory of law as a system of validity with a sociological theory, um, I think this is related because in Brazil, certainly things like class are going to play some role in law. And even though the law is a system of uh, validity, right, it says, you know, one ought to do this, right? Uh, it's not perfectly administered in the way that it should be. And part of this, these imperfections can be explained by things like class and race and so on, which sort of distort the validity of the law. And so the law, even though it is sort of ideally valid, is not in its application uh, ideal. And so there are, there's a need for, for reforms and for uh, these kinds of changes. And so what Heller would specifically, uh, or in this regard, Heller specifically thinks that social reforms are necessary so that law can become more just, uh, but also reforms within the law uh, where the law is not living up to its own ideals should be taking place as well, right? But this is not really something that the theorist himself can do. It's something that the political system has to do. And so hopefully this gets at something like an answer, um, but I know that might not be satisfactory, uh, but unfortunately I don't know the situation in Brazil well enough to really uh, give a better answer, I think. Yes, uh, I guess here in Brazil, uh the major issue may be that we have uh, laws that are too idealistic. Uh, for example, in education, we have a great body of rules that state the necessity of open and free education for everybody, uh, that addresses issues such as critical thinking and how to uh, enable our students to develop as, as emancipated beings, but we do not find this in the reality. Uh, probably because of these uh, issues that you stressed, such as class, race, and political culture. <laughs> not to be uh, repetitive, but this is this might be uh, um, a matter that needs to be taken into account when we are 
thinking about the val validity of flow here. Yeah, that's I, I, what you said there at the end reminded me of uh, another sort of aspect of Heller's political activity, which was that he was involved in adult education. And so for a long time, he was a teacher at these um, these worker education programs in Germany, where he was actively engaged in teaching people who had not received an education, trying to undo some of these inequalities that you were talking about. And part of this also, uh, he thinks, is necessary because one has to have citizens who are politically educated and who have sort of uh, this familiarity with the with political life so that they can then have a political culture that can support democracy. And so I think what you're saying about political culture here is exactly right. And this in many ways, uh, I think, is illustrated through Heller's participation in these adult education programs and worker education programs where he was trying to uh, ameliorate some of these inequalities that were at the time. In Thank you, Joseph. Um, if we don't have any questions, I guess uh, we are in the end of our lecture. Uh, I, I should uh, ask you if you had any final comments, anything that you want to add to, to us, please feel free. Yeah, well, I'm very thankful uh, that uh, you all allowed me to come and pr uh, present my research here. This is still a very early stage. Um, as I said at the beginning, I hope to continue this in my dissertation project, but uh, this is sort of a, a small foretaste of what hopefully is to come that will be a much larger uh, project working on Heller's thought. So uh, thank you for bearing with this kind of rudimentary and uh, early stage of my research. It was aligning uh, for us. It was nothing like early stage, but but a very advanced uh, lecture. Well, thank you, Joseph. Uh, muito obrigada a todos e a todas que assistiram até aqui. Foi excelente e a gente espera que we all hope that you come back here to Brazil and present your research as it developed. Uh, too. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Joseph. Bye, everyone.